There were two last minute major setbacks in the planning of the 1916 Rising. One, Roger Caseman travelled to Germany, England's enemy in the war, and secured 20,000 German rifles, 100,000 rounds of ammunition, 10 machine guns and explosives. The odd was due to arrive off the coast of Kerry on Good Friday, yet it arrived on Thursday a day early and was spotted by the British Navy. The ship was scuttled so that the British could not get the weapons. Casement was also arrested. Two, another major setback occurred when McNeil found out that the castle document was a forgery. He put a notice in the national newspapers on Easter Saturday, calling off all manoeuvres for Dublin on Sunday. This meant that men and women around the country cancelled their plans for the rising the following day. The IRB had an emergency meeting and voted to go ahead with the rising, but to postpone it by 24 hours. Some historians argue that they believe they had some chance of success, at least with getting recognition from America, but others argue that they carried out the rising with blood sacrifice in mind, particularly Pierce, whom they argue was ready to die for Ireland and become a martyr, in order to inspire future generations to carry on the fight. The rising was planned to be a nationwide event, but due to the countermanding order of MacNeil, most of the fighting took place in Dublin as it was easier to get word out to the rebels there to mobilise. The Dublin plan for the rising was a static plan, to seize major landmark buildings around the city and wait for the British attack. The headquarters was the GPO, the General Post Office in O'Connell Street, then Sackville Street. Other buildings in a ring around the perimeter of the city were to be taken to delay the movement of British troops from the barracks around its perimeter from reaching the GPO for as long as possible, while word was sent out to the world that the Irish Republic has been proclaimed. Due to the setbacks, the rebels had a maximum of 1,500 rebels fighting across the city. The rising began around noon on Easter Monday, the 24th of April. The rebels included members of the IRB, the Irish Volunteers, the Irish Citizen Army, Cumann Amon and Athena Aaron. After the GPO was seized, Pierce read the proclamation of the Irish Republic outside. It was signed by the seven members of the Military Council of the IRB. A flag proclaiming the Irish Republic was draped from the portico of the building. Pierce was declared the President of the Provisional Government of the Irish Republic. James Connolly was also in the GPO and was Commandant General of the Rebels. Some of the other garrisons seized included City Hall under Citizen Army Captain Sean Connolly, Boland's Mills under Eamon de Valera and the Four Courts under Ned Daly. The British managed to get 16,000 British soldiers into the city by the end of the week. The British never sent infantry into the GPO. They brought a gunship down the River Liffey on Wednesday, the Helga. It shelled the GPO and by Friday night it had to be evacuated due to a blazing fire. The headquarters took up a new HQ at 16 Moore Street. Eventually, due to the high numbers of civilian casualties and with hot no the hope of preserving the next generation to continue on the fight, Pierce and the leaders decided to surrender. Elizabeth O'Farrell carried the surrender flag up to the heavily manned British barricade on Parnell Street. Pierce eventually agreed to an unconditional surrender from General Lowe, the commanding officer of the British forces in Dublin at the time. The other garrisons got word of the surrender from Pierce and had to obey the order regardless of their military position at the time. The note did not reach some garrisons until Sunday when the last of the official fighting took place. Although many garrisons inflicted heavy British casualties and were holding out in their own areas, the rising was a military failure overall. This was due to the following reasons. One, it was not a nationwide rebellion and the British could concentrate all their forces in Dublin. Two, the rebels were outnumbered by the British. Three, the static military strategy made it easy for the British to surround them. Four, they were outgunned by the British who had more up-to-date rifles, more of them, machine guns and artillery. So what were the effects of the rising? One, General Maxwell replaced General Lowe and imposed martial law in Ireland. Two, over 3,000 people were arrested around the country, many of whom were innocent. Three, 90 people were sentenced to death. 16 were executed before the executions were called off. Between the 3rd and 12th of May, 14 were shot by firing squad in the Stonebreakers Yard in Kilmainham Jail. Thomas Kent was shot in Cork and Roger Casement was hanged in August in Pentonville Prison in London. Two famous cases of leaders' sentences, sentences to death who escaped included Countess Markovich, saved as she was a woman, and Eamon de Valera. 
For a change in public opinion, most Dubliners were hostile to the rebels during the fighting, yet as the executions dragged on, there was a rapid turnaround in public opinion. So why did public opinion change? One, the fact that so many innocent people were arrested. Over 3,000 were arrested in total. The nature of the executions, for example, James Connolly was wounded in the Rising and was treated for his wounds by the British in Dublin Castle and then taken to Kilmainham Jail, where he was tied to a chair and shot. Joseph Plunkett married his fiancée, Grace Gifford, in the chapel in Kilmainham Jail, hours before being taken down and shot dead. These stories, along with the long drawn out nature of the executions, led to public sympathy. Three, the British atrocities during the Rising, including the North King Street Massacre, in which the British bayoneted 15 civilians to death in their homes, and the cold-blooded murder of Irish pacifist Francis Sheehy Scaffington in rat mines by a British army officer. Eventually, the British realised the turn in opinion and the executions were called off. The remaining death sentences were commuted to life in prison. Many prisoners, both male and female, were sent to internment camps and prisons in England and Wales. Frongoch in Wales became known as the University of Revolution, as a lot of men sent there had no involvement with the Rising, yet they became revolutionaries in prison. It was here that Michael Collins emerged as a leader. The prisoners were all released within a year under a general amnesty. So although the Rising was a military failure, it was a political success. You could also say that it was a short-term failure, but a long-term success. This was because it completely changed political opinion in Ireland. The majority of nationalists in Ireland no longer wanted home rule. They now wanted nothing short of an Irish Republic, including complete separation from Britain. In the words of W.B. Yeats, Macdonough and Macbride and Conley and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. For the Irish rebellion has just been defeated. Over 400 people have lost their lives from all sides of the conflict, including innocent civilians who got caught up in the affair. And less than five years later, the British Army and administration vacated the southern 26 counties of Ireland. How did this come to be so quickly? Like and subscribe to find out in episode 4. I'm Miss Murphy and thank you for watching Know Your History.